Okay, so um, today's presentation uh, is about robustness of smart meter strategies, and we'll try to do also a competitor uh, overview. Uh, so the main topics uh, today um, is to to understand why why it is important to assess robustness um, of of factor strategies of smart beta strategies, and um, um, to see what is the um, the ways that the investors can uh, can um, can make sure that their their, their choices are complemented with a, with a good. Uh, um, uh, robustness framework um, around the choice of strategies. So the, the usual problem that we see in, in investment strategies generally is that any in-sample results that we, we observe, um, usually uh, there is um, an out-of-sample degradation of, of performance or of their characteristics. So um, uh, what we want to highlight here is that investors should always look for instead of just the in sample results they should look for a consistent construction framework and from for transparency on the side of the strategy provider so this on the qualitative side is very important and then what we also want to say is that on the quantitative side investors should be able to also measure the robustness of their strategy using appropriate true tools and metrics this way, they can cross-check quantitatively whether the, the objective of the, of the strategy is met in practice and they can feel more confident about the, the, the out-of-sample or the real performance of the strategy. So these are the two main uh, topics that we, we will cover today. So um, first, on the qualitative side, we will present the, the common sources that can lead to a lack of robustness. And at the same time, we will, we will explain the, the methods that the scientific beta is using to improve robustness in the space. Um, and then on the quantitative side, we will present to you our robustness protocol. And this robustness protocol is covering uh, appropriate measurements or metrics of robustness that can help investors uh, evaluate uh, their strategies. Um, throughout the presentation, we will make the point that um, there, is a, there is a set of multi-factor strategies out there that tend to suffer from uh, uh, low factor uh, diversification and exposure quality, which is problematic. And uh, we will also quantitatively assess uh, some strategies to, to, to see uh, whether problems in the in design framework are also popping out on the side of assessing quantitatively the strategy. So these are the topics that we will cover today. And I will begin on the on the side of robustness in the index design so let's say on the qualitative side uh, in this case uh, we have some common sources of lack of robustness and then these can be categorized uh, mainly in um, in, uh, in 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 topics around first the first family of these topics is around the choice of factors so a common problem that we see is what we call factor fishing. Factor fishing is the practice of identifying empirical factors based, based only on, on, on the in-sample performance. So it's a common problem in, in the industry. And um, we, there is papers like the one from Harvey 2016 that shows that it's very easy to find um, positive risk premium in, in the history. It's very easy to, to discover factors uh, because usually uh, this is the result of many, many researchers going through the same data set uh, with the aim of finding uh, good results. So this is what we call generally data mining. Um, here on this slide, I have an empirical example whereby you can see that it's very easy to pick um, in sample a variable that works very well. And we do this here in the case of value. Uh, 
We use definitions of value other than book to market in the in-sample period. And then each, each time we pick the best performing variable and we measure its performance out of sample. So we do this every, every year for 30 years and we, uh, and we measure for a five year formation period what was the five year out of sample uh, performance. And the graph shows you that uh, it's very easy in sample in the orange color to find something that performs better than the book to market. But when this variable is, is exposed to the out of sample period, it uh, usually underperforms uh, the book to market, which remains the simple academic definition for, 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 for the value premium. Um, now, it's, it, it's useful here to pause and think that this example is done with single variables. If you try to expand this, uh, this exercise to composite variables, the degrees of freedom explode and it's much more easy to find good in sample results. So in this case, we are using about uh, 10 uh, variables, but imagine if you have 10 variables and you start to create pairs or triplets, you start to create composite variables, the degrees of freedoms explode. And this highlights a bit the problem of um, in sample data mining, that it's relatively easy to find a good result. But what is important is something that can, uh, can last the, the test of, of out of sample, uh, of, of out of sample. A second problem uh, in the same family is that of factor redundancy. So usually we see uh, products um, that use factors above and beyond the usual factors that are proven in the, in the academic uh, literature. A characteristic example is the dividend yield, where here, for example, we do the exercise of uh, finding what is the premium and then testing it against uh, the, usual, uh, uh, the usual factors. What you find is that, for example, for the dividend yield, when you adjust returns for the book to market effect, you see that uh, the, the remaining premium is actually negative. So what really happens is that the dividend yield is a redundant factor. It can be explained uh, away from exposure to, to the standard factors. This, this is lack of robustness because investors that focus on, um, focus on alternative factors or factors that are redundant can easily create, for example, multi-factor products that pile up essentially to the same factor exposure. And instead of being factor diversified, in reality, they are, uh, they are concentrated because they, they take exposure to a single factor. Now, what is the solution to this? The solution is for investors to focus on factors that have a, a strong economic rationale and also to focus on providers that have a consistent framework in the construction of indices. Now, on the economic rationale, for, for people that follow our indices, they know, um, they know very well that we focus on six uh, academically validated uh, uh, factors that have um, an economic justification. And this economic justification is important because it explains to you that this factor exists because it gives you um, it gives you exposure to a systematic risk that requires a reward so it's very important for your factors to have this economic justification and then number two in order to av avoid data mining issues is important to to see to focus on a consistency in the framework so as we will see later, we will see examples of providers having indices that are between themselves quite inconsistent. They have different factor choices or um, they use different methodologies. This is a sign of concern because it prompts you to think that probably this inconsistency is the result of searching for a good in-sample performance. And as time goes by, um, people just come up with a new definition or with a new methodology to, 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 to cover uh, the performance. So this, uh, we can 
Then the second family of, of, of lack of robustness is, has to do with strategy specific or idiosyncratic risks. Now, idiosyncratic risks are unrewarded in the long term, and therefore investors should not be exposed to them. Now, in factor strategies, we have some choices, some common choices uh, that exacerbate these idiosyncratic risks. For example, the, the choice of using factor scores in the determination of the portfolio, what it does is that it, in, it implies that a, a stock with a higher factor score will have a higher uh, out of sample return. Now, this is risky as a, as a concept because uh, factor scores are essentially return estimates and return estimates, we know that they are very, very noisy. Instead, the factor investing literature is, is um, explaining premia as diversified portfolios of stocks rather than concentrated uh, exposure to stocks. The second uh, dimension of this idiosyncratic risk problem is other weighting schemes like cap weight that again increase concentration. Um, concentration uh, will give you a, a portfolio that in risk reward terms it will be inefficient compared to a broadly diversified portfolio. So the solution to this problem um, is to focus on well diversified portfolios and uh, people that follow our indices know very well that uh, after the, the selection of, of, of factors, the second step is to create a broadly diversified portfolio to reduce this uh, unrewarded uh, idiosyncratic risks. Now, when you choose a, a weighting scheme, even if the, the goal of this weighting scheme is to uh, provide diversification, the, the risk is that you take a little bit of model risk on the specific choice. So for our indices, what we do is, is a balance of weighting schemes. So you try to reduce this model risk by using four uh, well-diversified weighting schemes and take the average. In this case, with this framework, you, you aim for diversified portfolios and you also uh, diversify away uh, model risk. Um, now the, the, third, the third, let's say, family of, of lack of robustness comes from the fact that methodological choices to, to, uh, to, the, to, to, to the creation of factor strategies essentially gives rise to multi-factor products that suffer from factor dilution. So for example, a strategy uh, that uses, uh, for example, we, we, we saw here on, on, on the slide, uh, two strategies. One strategy that has a, 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 a beta to the low investment factor and zero to the other factors. And another strategy that has a fixed score to low investment and zero score to the other uh, factors. When you take this score-based strategy and you regress it against the common factors, you see that essentially they have exposure to the other factors and they have usually negative exposure to the other factors. So uh, as a, a factor strategy constructed with this logic, when put together with other factor strategies, they can easily cancel each other out and um, any concept of factor diversification uh, gets wasted. So we ha you have this factor dilution problem. Now, the solution to this is for investors uh, to focus on what we call factor exposure quality, focus for higher factor exposure quality. This is very important because strategies with high factor exposure quality um, can give you more confidence that they are robust and that they, they, they can give you a robust result out of sample. Now, how we achieve this in practice is through our HFI filter. The HFI filter is able to uh, remove factor losers. 
from the uh, factor selection and therefore allows you for uh, factor strategies that have the desired factor exposure, the desired tilt to the factor, but at the same time, they do not have negative exposure to other factors. So when you put them together, you end up with a multi-factor strategy that has strong factor intensity and good diversification of factor exposures. The combination of the two is what we call factor exposure quality. And this is what investors should be, should be looking after. So this is what the, the, the goal should be. And in this example, we try to show, um, we will try to demonstrate that for the same choice of factors, the same choice of weighting scheme, uh, by applying the HFI filter, filter, it allows you to almost triple your factor exposure quality. And this comes from uh, an increased factor intensity and an increased factor diversification. So this is uh, quite useful for investors to look for this factor exposure, exposure quality metric instead of just simple uh, factor intensity metrics because, for example, you can have the case where a strategy appears to have strong factor intensity, but it may come from one or two factors. So there's no factor diversification. So with the, with the factor exposure quality metric, it's um, straightforward to take into account both. And, and, uh, and this is important in, in robustness terms because out of sample, you don't know if one specific factor will out outperform relative to another factor. So factor products that take uh, non-explicit factor bets in the history uh, are not considered to be uh, robust and any in-sample performance can be the result of luck that they picked out of luck the right factors for the right sample. What it makes sense is to have these high betas to all factors and a balanced exposure to all factors so that out of sample, uh, independent of whether one factor outperforms, you can have, um, you can have more balanced and smooth uh, performance. Um, at this point, I will try to give you a couple of examples from uh, competitor indices that uh, we have analyzed and we've seen their methodological choices to highlight this, these topics that we, that we discussed. So, uh, on the left, you can see a list of, of strategies and on, on the right, you can see some examples. I will just uh, pick um, uh, one or two. For example, um, if you focus on the second uh, row, you have this FUCI JP Morgan Diversified uh, Factor Index. You can see that this index is targeting three factors, but if you look more deeply on the product offering of uh, Fuji with JP Morgan, you can see that they are offering five factors as individual products. So there has been already an arbitrary choice of, of factors for the multi-factor product. Um, the other thing that is concerning is that for the two factors that are missing out, dividend yield and low volatility in this case, you can see that they appear as subcomponents of the three factors that are already in the multi-factor product. And then here it's easy to highlight the problem of composite variables because you can see that for, for value, um, this strategy provider is using four variables or for quality, they are using 10 variables. And then on top for, for, for the 10 variables of quality, they are splitting it out into, into three families. So it's a good example to see how easily you can increase the degrees of freedoms, the degrees of freedom in the, in the index construction. Um, I think another good example is the two MSCI indices. For example, the MSCI diversified multifactor targets four factors, excluding low volatility. But if you look at another family of uh, their products, the factor mix, this one targets three factors and now low volatility is included instead of momentum and low size. 
So this is another good example that can, uh, that can help me uh, talk about inconsistency of index design. Inconsistency of index design uh, appears when a strategy provider um, over time changes their product uh, choices and end up with products that are competing to each other or they have different choices of factors or they even have different um, choices for portfolio allocation. So again, for if I focus in the two MSCI products, we saw that they have different choice of factors, but we also see here that they have uh, one product is using a bottom-up approach and the other product is using a top-down approach to factor allocation. So investors may, can, may get confused on what, what, is the, the appropriate, uh, what is the appropriate method if they look at these two uh, families of products from the same provider. Um, one last example is, is probably, but is to show that, for example, for the first row, the FTSE Russell, FTSE Russell index, um, you can see that the factor exposure is coming from uh, multiplicative tilts. Now, the multiplicative tilts, unlike our HFI filter, are not able to take into account these cross-factor interactions. So, they can easily lead to portfolios that don't have good factor diversification. And we will see this uh, in the later sections where we will see some numerical, uh, numerical results. And um, Eric, this is the, the uh, let's say, the overview of this first section about qualitative uh, points on, on lack of robustness, if you like. Okay, so thank you very much, Dimitris, and apologies for not, uh, not being able to join you earlier. I had problems with my, um, with my internet here. Um, so just to uh, give uh, Dimitris a, a moment uh, to pause for thought, um, the, in, this, in this first section that uh, Dimitris presented to us, um, he raised um, a number of issues, in, uh, common issues in, in factor, um, factor products. The first one um, related to um, how factors are defined, um, and here you have the problem of factor phishing and also factor redundancy. And what Dimitri suggested is that the best way to get around that is use the set of non-redundant factors that have been well established um, in the academic research where we understand uh, the explanations behind these premia instead of just trying to come up with yet a new factor. So having um, a set of non-redundant factors that have been, um, that have been well understood um, and uh, being published in academic research with an economic rationale is very, very important from that perspective. Um, then secondly, this is just when I joined, um, I heard Dimitri talking about stock weighting. Um, now, stock weightings for factor products can be based on many different ways. You can weight stocks, companies in many, many different ways, but then the problem is you might have some unintended biases. You might expose yourself to some additional risk some uh, unrewarded risk. Essentially, you're trying to capture factors, but by putting too much weight on one thing or another, you may actually expose yourself to some other unrewarded risk. And the best way to get around that, what Dimitris was suggesting, is to try to diversify away um, stock-specific risk by having a well-diversified weighting uh, scheme so that you avoid problems in terms of exposure to other factors. Try to reduce that as much as you can through a well-diversified weighting scheme. So that was the second issue. Now the third issue, um, he, uh, Dimitris talks a little bit about factor scores. Um, factor scores are not the same as factor betas. Factor scores are determined on a cross-sectional basis. And if you design a portfolio based on factor scores, you won't get the betas that you are expecting. You won't get the betas according to the scores that you were targeting. Um, because scores don't take into account uh, a time series correlation. So um, we're very, very wary about using scores um, as a way to construct the factor portfolio because scores are not the same as betas. And this is a, a, an important point. And then finally, um, Dimitri's uh, concentrated on something called a high factor intensity filter. So the idea is 
when you uh, design a product that gives you exposure to one factor, um, you may end up with negative exposure to another factor. Um, and therefore, to get around this problem, when you combine the different portfolios, you can introduce a filter to filter out the stocks that would have given you a negative exposure. So this is um, very important, and it means that when you put the multi-factor product together, you will end up with a much higher overall um, exposure to all the factors. And the other interesting thing about this filter is when you filter out these bad stocks, these stocks that have a negative exposure to something else, well, that negative exposure can, can vary over time for each factor. So you can also take into account the strength of the other factors as well um, using this filter. And in that way, you end up with a much more balanced exposure, a stronger and more balanced exposure across all factors. And I think that uh, Dimitris later on is going to demonstrate the importance of having a balanced um, exposure to all the factors. So that was um, the, the four important elements that lead to a, a, a lack of robustness. Um, but in the uh, next section, um, we re uh, um, we're going to ask Dimitris um, to address, well, if there is a lack of robustness, how do I measure this lack of robustness? What kind of measurements uh, should I use? And should I use one measurement for one strategy, another measurement for another? Or is there a common framework or a protocol that you can apply consistently to other factor strategies to try to assess robustness? So I'll hand back over to you, uh, Dimitris, to talk a little bit about the measures that can be used to um, identify a lack of robustness and also the framework. Uh, thank you, Eric. Yes, indeed, what makes sense in this topic is to have an array of tools or an array of metrics that can help you um, gauge the, the robustness of, uh, of, of your factor strategy. Um, so in this slide, we, we show the, the different dimensions that we, we, we focus on our robustness protocol. Our robustness protocol uh, is um, a set of, of tools and metrics that uh, help you assess the robustness. So the first dimension is um, looking more closely and examining the factor exposure quality of your strategy. Uh, which means looking more closely at the combination of the factor intensity and of the factor deconcentration of the strategy. So the first dimension is about measuring this fa the factor exposure and measuring um, how balanced and strong are the exposures to factors. The second dimension is about uh, conditionality of your strategy with respect to market regimes. So we, we want to measure whether you, whether a strategy is highly dependent on a particular regime. Uh, the third pillar is about the stability of performance and risk over time. Uh, and uh, we will see what this means in a moment, but uh, it, has to do about, it has to do with, again, with looking at average numbers over an in-sample period. It makes more sense to evaluate the performance of the strategy using rolling statistics using extreme statistics to see how the, the strategy performs uh, in different market conditions. Um, the fourth pillar is, is an econometric test and it's very useful. It's something that can tell us whether a, an observed difference in risk-adjusted returns, an observed difference on paper, is really significant when you apply an econometric test to it. And uh, finally, the, the, fifth bigger, the fifth pillar is about aiming to test your strategy out of the in-sample period. So uh, expose your strategy to, uh, to out-of-sample testing. So we will try to explain now these this, this five pillars. Uh, as we discussed already, the first one is about uh, factor exposure quality, is about the factor exposures, how well balanced they are and how strong they are. Um, and, and, and here, I will just reiterate that um, investors should be um, aware that the strategy can easily have a strong factor intensity, but this factor intensity can come from one or two factor bets. Instead, what they should be uh, looking for is high betas, but balanced out across uh, all factors. 
And a good measure to, to highlight if there is a problem or not is factor exposure quality. The, uh, the second dimension is uh, about conditionality. And here our protocol is uh, looking at different dimensions of regimes. That is, it's looking at conditionality with respect to the market, conditionality with respect to the sectors, conditionality with respect to the factors, and also with respect to their volatilities. So we have a metric called conditional ratio, which looks at the performance of the strategy during a bull or a bear regime. And this regime is defined according to the definitions I just, I just gave you. Um, and we, with this metric that is, is ranging between zero and two, you can uh, gauge quickly whether your strategy is highly conditional, highly dependent on a certain market regime. Uh, for example, um, you can have a very good performing strategy in sample that when you do this conditionality test, it pops out that it's highly conditional to the market, for example. In this case, um, you should be uh, worried that if the same um, market performance or if the same market regime does not repeat itself in the out of sample, it's very possible that your strategy will not repeat the performance that it had in the in sample period. So it's a good metric to give you uh, a sense of how, um, how dependent your performance was on a certain market regime. Um, the next uh, pillar is about um, stability of performance. And on the right, we have a graph that shows the, the rolling return of S&P 500. So someone can look at this graph and say for, for a 10 year period, I had a 15% return or another person can say that for a 10 year period, I had a 0% return, depending where you started and where you finished. So this highlights the problem with average statistics and to go beyond this problem, we calculate rolling statistics. And in the case of performance, we have a metric that we call outperformance probability. And this metric is, is, is the empirical frequency for uh, different entry points and on a rolling basis to show you how often you outperform uh, your benchmark. So it gets rid of this problem of fixed entry and exit points. And, and uh, to give you a sense, a, 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 a metric above 50% means that your strategy for all uh, rolling periods, for example, one year, three year, or five year, it outperformed more than 50% of the time um, with respect to your benchmark. So what you're looking for here is you're looking metrics that are as high as possible and also metrics that increase with the time horizon because this is important for long-term investors that over many years the empirical frequency of outperforming the benchmark is getting higher and higher um, another um, Another uh, measure for, for the stability is to focus on, on risk and to focus, for example, on volatility. Volatility is something that usually uh, fluctuates and spikes also uh, quite often, uh, and it's never actually near uh, its average uh, metric. So what it makes sense for investors is to go beyond the average volatility and calculate extreme rolling statistics for, for volatility. For example, we calculate the 5% worst volatility. This gives investors uh, a feeling and understanding of where the, the, the risk of their strategy can end up uh, during the life of the product. Uh, moving on to uh, our sharp ratio test. So here, um, this is a technical test, but it's also a very useful and intuitive one. So if you have two strategies that have a different sharp ratio, one is your factor strategy, for example, and the other one is the benchmark, what it makes sense is to apply a, an econometric test to see if the, 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 the difference that you observe on paper is really uh, statistically significant. 
uh, the reason that this this family of tests um, started in uh, in the academic literature is again because of the of the problem of data mining so imagine that for a factor strategy that outperforms there is thousands other uh, possibilities to construct a portfolio so these tests uh, were built with this with this logic in mind so that uh, investors or uh, researchers can can have an econometric test to tell them whether an observed difference in sharp ratio is also statistically significant uh, and finally and an, another pillar of our protocol is to try where possible to go um, outside the given sample so given a sample you can have your average statistics and you can have also your robustness protocol but it makes sense to try to go even beyond this given sample and we try to do this in two ways one way is to apply the methodology of a strategy to other geographies so try to see if your factor strategy that performs really well in the US for example is it performing similarly in other regions so if yes then this makes you feel more comfortable and another approach is to estimate your factor exposure for the given sample and if this estimation let's say it's um, relatively stable you can take it project it over a much longer period and in our case we use our long-term track record data which cover 50, 40, uh, 45 years and see how the strategy performed also on this different longer sample so with this with these tools with this array of tools investors can gauge the robustness of their strategy and they can um, uh, look at them simultaneously so uh, see um, how the performance was in sample together with the conditionality together with the a sharp pressure test and get a, a full picture of how the the strategy has performed uh, and with this i will uh, will pass on to to eric uh, to give us thank you thank you very much dimitri so i mean clearly there are a lot of measures um, you can use to try to um, assess robustness and um, while you were uh, talking dimitris we had also a question about um, how do these robustness measures relate to what happened recently, uh, particularly during the, the COVID crisis? Um, I'm wondering, yeah, maybe I will address this question now and before we move on to the next section. Um, so the question was, what happened during the COVID crisis? So, um, in, you, first of all, the first pillar that uh, Dimitris uh, talked about was the factor exposure quality. Now, during the COVID crisis, it was very interesting because the differences in performance across the factors was huge. So for example, value did really, really poorly because value companies with a large fixed asset base, they stopped doing business. They're the ones that suffered most of all. Whereas another uh, factor like profitability, um, those companies did, did really well. So what, do, what can we learn about the COVID crisis and this robustness protocol? Well, what it teaches us is that, well, I could have been really lucky or unlucky. I could have been in a value strategy and performed really poorly, or I could have been in a profitability strategy and performed really well. Now, it's impossible to know which factors are going to perform at a different time. So what, what this protocol is saying is let's try to balance out our exposure across as many different factors as possible. Because during the COVID crisis, if you actually managed to balance all your factor exposures, um, factors would have contributed very little to the performance of the multi-factor strategy. So it provided us a, a great insight in terms of also what happened to, to COVID. Factors were very different in terms of performance. So it means factors were important because it explained what happened during COVID. Um, but if you had a nice balanced approach, this is what uh, uh, Dimitris was referring to factor deconcentration, you wouldn't have suffered very much from a factor, factor perspective. Now, um, what happened to our strategies during the COVID crisis was something else that happened, which is that you had, because of the very sudden, sharp downward correction, you had a flight to, to uh, the largest blue chip companies. So what happened is 
the, the very large companies did extremely well. They outperformed by something like 3.5% over that quarter. Um, so if 5% of the companies did well, it means that 95% of the companies did poorly. And if you have a more diversified approach, that's going to create a drag in terms of performance to your strategy. So that was one of the, the, the drivers of uh, performance. And then the, lastly, there is the market beta as well. Um, normally, this strategy is defensive on average, but during the COVID crisis, that defensiveness didn't help us. It didn't hurt us either, but it certainly didn't help us um, because the market beta um, actually increased and was about the same level as the market. We can come back to um, discussions about performance um, later, but the idea here is just to highlight the fact that the performance of factors, particularly during COVID, was so, so different. Um, and what this factor exposure quality shows us is having a good balance across factors meant that at least the factor performance um, wouldn't have been extreme because you would have had well-balanced exposure. And it's not so much the factors themselves that hurt the strategy, but it's more the flight to quality um, that, that uh, hurts the performance of the strategy. I'll leave it here because I'm uh, wary also of time. Um, I would like to uh, get Dimitri now to um, apply this protocol, um, this robustness protocol. I mean, we presented the, the, the ideas and the theory behind it, but the idea now is to look at it in practice. Let's apply this protocol and let's see what it tells us about multi-factor strategies um, that exist on the market. So I'll hand back over to you, Dimitris, um, to give us some examples of applying the, the protocol to um, factor strategies, ours as well as competitors. Okay, thank you, Eric. Yes, indeed. So in this section, we, we are applying this, this protocol um, with some real examples. And um, the first pillar, as we discussed, is about factor exposures and looking at the, the factor exposure quality. So in this case, we take the same indices that we discussed in the first uh, section. Um, we apply the uh, risk factor exposure. We have the column which averages the numbers to give us an average picture. And then on the right hand side, uh, with the gray color, we have the two scientific beta indices, the standard multifactor and the one that adjusts, adjusts for, uh, for uh, market beta. So our MBA, multi -bit, um, uh, our uh, market beta adjustment uh, index. So what uh, is useful here is here to see is that for example, Going to the good news is that for the scientific beta indices, for example, you have uh, a high factor exposure quality, which is much higher uh, than, uh, than the average of competitors, twice as high. And this is the result of both a strong factor intensity, 0.63 in this case, and a strong factor deconcentration, uh, a little bit more than five. Um, now, what this five number means, it means that you, are, you were effectively uh, exposed to 5.14 factors with, with, uh, with the absolute maximum being six. So you were quite well balanced across factors and this coupled with strong betas gave you a good factor exposure quality uh, over the period. Um, conversely, for some other uh, products, we can see that, uh, for example, I will go to, this, to the smallest numbers. For example, for MSCI factor mix, uh, essentially you had a factor deconcentration of two. This means that effectively this index was taking only two factor bets out of six. Um, now, the factor contribution, and this is a good example, is relatively high for this product. It means that over the period, the, the, the product was uh, tilted uh, towards the correct factors. It was lucky to be in the two factors that uh, performed well. Um, however, you can have other examples like the last column where the, the product was again exposed to, uh, to two factors, but the factor contribution was very negative. So it was exposed to the wrong factors. So this is a good example to, to tell you that it, from a long-term perspective and from a robustness perspective, an invest, for an investor it makes sense to aim for high factor deconcentration, balanced bets to factors, and strong factor intensity. This will help you balance out um, 
short-term periods of underperformance of certain factors um, for, for which other products can get lucky or not lucky. Um, I think I will uh, move on to the next uh, point here, uh, which is about uh, conditionality. Now, it was uh, also interesting to see that most of these strategies um, rank high with respect to our conditional uh, ratio metric, which has a, a maximum value of two. Uh, now, what is interesting to observe here is that our MBA strategy, once you correct for the market beta uh, bias and you are left with, um, on top, you have good factor diversification and good factor uh, intensity, you see that your strategy um, starts to have low conditionality to, to regimes. It means that um, it will tend to, to perform well in different, in different uh, market conditions. So, um, for example, a, a, a strategy that performed really well, uh, for example, we saw in the previous slide some factor, uh, high factor, uh, factor contribution, for example, for MSCI or S&P, it means that the, by looking at this table in conjunction, it means that this performance came from, a, from a, a particular regime. And if this regime does not repeat itself in, in, in the future, it's not clear whether the strategy will, will perform similarly. It gives you this picture, this, this conditionality ratio. Now, um, the, the, the third dimension that we were talking about is rolling statistics. And, and, and here, what investors should be looking at is they should be looking at, um, for example, for the, starting with the outperformance probability, we calculate it over different horizons, one, three, and five years. So what it makes sense here is you have to aim for higher numbers as possible, as high as possible. But quite importantly, you should be aiming for numbers that increase over time, because this is important for long-term investors. Um, this upward sloping uh, curve for outperformance probabilities is, is useful. And you can see that on the right-hand side, the, the scientific beta indices, they have this, they have this, um, this um, shape. Whereas for some other products, you can see that this statistic deteriorates over, over time. Um, so in investors with long-term horizons should be worried if, if their factor strategy starts to appear to degradate in terms of, uh, of outperformance. is is a good measure uh, of robustness. Now, another measure is for, people, for investors to look closely at, and we discussed this, is uh, extreme statistics for, for risk. So instead of just looking at the average volatility over the period, um, they can calculate a, a, a 5% worst vol, for example, and we do this for a three-year rolling uh, window. And we show these numbers in our robustness protocol for, for investors to go to the extreme risks of their strategy. Um, I will move on to the SARP ratio test. And here, what you are looking for is you are looking for a p-value that is ideally below the classic confidence interval uh, levels, for example, the 1%, 5 or 10%. So in that case, it means that your sharp ratio difference is statistically significant. Now, for some competitor indices or for many, we see that the test, that the test fails. It means that the observed difference is not statistically significant, and therefore the strategy from an econometric point of view is no different to the benchmark. Um, what we see also, and this is um, useful, is for strategies that pass the test, uh, it's good to, to go back and see all the measures in conjunction. That's what I, I mentioned at the beginning. For example, you have um, the MSCI or the S&P product um, passing, the, the, passing the test, but if we remind ourselves three, four slides before, their factor exposure quality was, one up, uh, was among the lowest. So this outperformance came uh, with, uh, let's say, a couple of lucky bets on, on factors that performed over this 10-year this period. 
So it's good to see always the metrics in, in conjunction. And in the case of scientific beta indices, we see that they passed the test. So the, the statistical uh, significance is there. And we also have seen before that also the factor diversification and factor intensity is there. So all these measures put together um, allow you to, to increase your confidence on the, on, on the robustness of, of, of the strategy. And uh, here I will, I will pause Eric for, uh, for a conclusion of, this, of these tests. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dimitris. Um, yes. Um, again, factor exposure quality, I think, is a very, very important, uh, a very important measure. But I think you've you've covered already, Dimitris, um, all yeah. uh, all the measures across all the different strategies. Uh, people will probably need to take some time to have a look at these figures, which they can look at the slides um, slides afterwards. Um, I am happy to move on at this stage in terms of conclusions, uh, Dimitri. So why don't you go ahead with that? And then I'll come back um, with some questions uh, that were raised by members of the audience. Uh, absolutely, yes. So to, to conclude and put everything uh, together, um, in this presentation, we, we saw that um, there is some uh, um, methodological choices that can lead to lack of robustness from some competitor products. Uh, and this, when we moved on to the quantitative side of evaluating robustness, we saw that these strategies are in deficit compared to the strong factor exposure quality of, of scientific beta indices. Um, it's useful to highlight uh, that a multi-factor strategy over a short sample uh, can get lucky or unlucky if it has um, a, a concentrated exposure to, to certain factors. What it makes sense for a long-term investor and from a robustness point of view is to um, increase your uh, diver factor diversification as much as possible and uh, coupled with, uh, with strong factor intensity uh, increase the confidence of, of your robustness, uh, of the robustness of your multi-factor strategy. Um, and uh, finally, uh, this presentation hopefully helped us uh, deliver the message that um, investors should look at uh, both a consistent uh, framework from the strategy provider and also use some uh, appropriate tools to have a quantitative evaluation of, of the robustness. And uh, we, with these two thoughts in mind, they can evaluate better smart beta strategies and they can make uh, more, informed, uh, more informed decisions. Eric, uh, I will... Uh, allow you to, to conclude. No, I, I think that's a, that's a very, very good summary. The importance of um, factor expo exposure quality, um, as well as the uh, factor robustness protocol. This protocol that uh, Dimitris has presented is a protocol that we actually use to assess our own strategies. Um, but now it's part actually of our scientific factor analytics service where we can use the same protocol to um, also assess uh, other strategies um, as well. We think it gives a very good overall picture in terms of robustness. Um, a few questions came through about the time period that we've selected and what happened during COVID and so on. I think we've got to take a, a little step back here and understand that when we try to assess the robustness of a strategy, we're not trying to um, we're not trying to assess ro robustness can't, can't be assessed over just a two to three uh, two to three month period. The analysis here is shown over ten years, ten calendar years is what we've shown. People who are interested also in understanding um, what happened over shorter periods of time, like for example in COVID and also during Q2. Um, we have written, uh, we're very transparent about this, we've written papers to explain precisely what happened uh, during COVID, 
using this um, robustness, uh, using some of the measures from the robustness uh, protocol. Um, so we're, we're very, very transparent about this. But let's just bear in mind that when you try to assess the robustness of a strategy, you're using uh, uh, the long-term data to try to understand what the sensitivities are of the strategy to different conditions, um, when some factors do well, when some factors do poorly, how is it impacted overall in terms of factor exposure and so on. What we're trying to understand is the sensitivity of the strategy um, and to see how robust it is in different market conditions. Um, and that's why we used a 10-year data set uh, to try to um, address that. 